and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for October 29th, 2020. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the state delegation update. Today's moderate co-moderator is Senator Pat Jalen. We are so pleased to be joined by Ellen Schachter. Ellen is the director of the Office of Housing Stability for the city of Somerville and by Renee Mardonis from Somerville Community Corporation, a nonprofit affordable housing provider. Welcome to you both, Senator Jalen. Good to have you back. Thank you. Glad to be here. And Terrific. this is so such an Thank important you. topic. So I'm so glad we have two people who really know what's going on and what what the problems are with it. So Senator, there are so many moving parts to the pandemic and I can think of maybe only two uh, that are a basic human rights, which are housing and food. Um, we have two great issues that are facing the city of Somerville, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the federal, uh, the federal government, which is what happens during a pandemic for those folks who can no longer afford their housing through no fault of their own, whether it be through loss of income or meet a greedy and manipulative property owners. Um, that is the subject for today, but I wanted to start off with you a little bit about, there was an initiative at the state house level to extend the governor's moratorium, um, trying to convince him not to end the eviction moratorium on October 17th. And now there is, as of the 18th, there is no protection for people. There is, however, protection here in the city of Somerville, and we're gonna bring Alan Schachter and Renee into that conversation. But my understanding is that there was a bill filed on the house side by Rep Conley, and that did not prevail. Do you wanna kind of update us on where that is now? Is there still an effort? Well, the, act, the, the eviction moratorium was initiated by the legislature in April. The governor signed it and he had the power to extend it. Um, he did extend it in July until October 17th and we were hoping that he would continue to do that because legislation is harder to, he can do it like that and we can't. Um, but we did file, uh, Rep Conley, uh, Chair, Chair Kevin Honan and I filed uh, legislation for an extension uh, with some modifications. We found it in July. Uh, it's been heard and referred to committees in both the House and Senate, um, but there's a lot of discussion. Uh, you said moving parts. There's a lot of discussion. Uh, what the governor did right before, right before like the 14th or 13th of October, right before the end of the moratorium, he issued a plan to, uh, well, some called it, he, at one point he called it expediting the, the evictions. Uh, Secretary Keneally at another point said to prevent evictions. Um, they better so, get their story straight in the state house. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it will probably do both. Um, if it's ever implemented, it will provide some relief for people uh, for both landlords and tenants because it increases the amount available for raft. Um, I think Ellen and Renee can both talk about what that might look like. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, tenants need to have rent paid in order to avoid eviction, mm -hmm. but landlords also have costs. And so if we can, I think money is <laughs> the main missing ingredient um, to prevent uh, homelessness. Well, we are, we are gonna talk extensively with Ellen and with Renee about the local types of things that are happening. But I can think of, and this is my term, I can think of nothing more cruel, and I've said it on shows, my shows in the past, nothing more cruel than to not try and protect people from being evicted during a pandemic and at the beginning of winter. My words, it's cruel. So I, I think what we have now is an abdication of responsibility by the federal government 
We now have the governor lifting his executive order or, or his signature on legislation that would have protected these people. And like anything else, it's now passed down to the municipality to try to protect its own residents. Ellen Schachter, I wanna kind of turn this over to you and let you frame it more in terms of what the city of Somerville and the Office of Housing Stability is trying to do. Thank you so much, Joe. I mean, I would like to just pick up for one moment on the state eviction diversion initiative, because I think it's important both to know what they are doing, so tenants have that information, but also what the gaps are that still remain after this eviction diversion initiative. Um, the eviction version initiative has done a number of things. Uh, there was a campaign for something called Right to Council um, at the state level, and that um, initiative calls for tenants, low-income tenants and low-income small property owners actually, to have attorneys in eviction cases, just like they would in criminal cases. And I've been very involved in that initiative. The mayor had supported it. So out of that right to counsel through um, a, a little piece of that carved out in what is now part of the eviction diversion initiative. So one thing I am grateful to the governor for, and I am, um, I'm very excited it's gonna happen, but has its real limitations, is that there is gonna be an expansion of legal services that are available to tenants facing eviction, um, both Cambridge and Somerville legal services in our area and De Novo legal, De Novo also is another legal services organization from Cambridge. They both will be um, funded for new staff that will be, um, that are put in place in response to uh, in response to the eviction diversion initiative. They did do some really positive things with RAFT, but I'm gonna tell you what some of the big problems are and why that moratorium is still really important. Um, RAFT is the state program that does help, it can help both tenants that are low and moderate income and landlords, small landlords or homeowners that are low and moderate income. My office, the Office of Housing Stability, has helped both landlords and tenants to access desperately needed money to pay their mortgages or to pay their rents. So, this, so what did happen is they increased the cap that any one family can um, get when applying for RAFT up to $10,000. But the real big problem that we have, and we were really wanting to make sure that there was a process by which we could say, if somebody is brought to court and they are being evicted, that if an application for rental assistance is filed, that they will not be evicted until there's an answer on that application and until that money is made available, right? So that the timing, right now, it can take two months, three months to get an answer on a rental assistance application. Court cases go much more quickly than that. So one of our big concerns, the governor's initiative does allow for expanded mediation. It does allow for increased access to attorneys. It does allow for increase in wrath. But what it didn't do was change the law so that a landlord would have to wait until there's an answer on that application before evicting a tenant for non-payment of rent. So there's pieces of this that are gonna really help some people that are in that eviction diversion initiative. But there are others where it's going to be a missed opportunity completely. Right now, um, it really relies on the owner's voluntary cooperation with this diversion process in order for it to successfully prevent evictions for non-payment of rent that are related to COVID. So, Ellen, I want to stop you for one minute. And when you say it is a voluntary cooperation yeah. by the landlord or by the property owner, Here's where I have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. We have some two and three family property owners here in Somerville that mm -hmm. I know personally right. that have a heart and they yes, have compassion and mm -hmm. they are willing to do that. We also mm -hmm. have some very large entities that own a huge swaths of property in Somerville mm -hmm. and could care less. Mm -hmm. Is that the problem? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately there's several things that might make a landlord not willing to wait for this diversion because people can say on the surface, well, we're going to give them money. Of course they would wait, right? But some landlords really take the position, look, this person has been unstable in their income. It's now eight months later. We have no guarantee where they're going to be later. We don't want to deal with this. We want to empty the unit and we want to start over with someone that has a higher income that's going to be a more reliable source of, of money. So I think some is completely not caring. 
I think some is maybe legitimately worried on their end that somebody's not going to be stable going forward. Maybe some of it is a lack of knowledge. There are laws that actually require landlords to cooperate with the RAF program, but not if that would extend the time past what we call a cure date. Right now, the law provides that tenants get up to 10 days if they're tenants at will from a notice to quit to pay up all money, and then the landlord can't evict. If it's a tenant under lease by right, they get to pay up until that answer date, right? So if it is before those cure dates and a tenant offers rental assistance or offers a program of rental assistance, by law, that landlord has to comply. But if the time frame doesn't fit and you're not offering something within the time frame that's required by law, you end up in a situation where if the landlord doesn't want to cooperate with that process, they're not going to. And whether or not money could be made available, they sure. end up at risk of eviction. So Ellen, this was something I caught you were doing a town hall with Mayor Curtis Tony the other night about this very subject. And it's something that piqued my interest when you were emphasizing the critical need for tenants to immediately get on the horn to your office or to other assistance agencies once they are noticed by the landlord because of that very point of the critical timing that's involved. I wanna stay with that just for a little bit, but I do wanna jump over to Renee for a bit because you touched on the fact that this is not only an issue for tenants, it is also an issue for the property owners who have a heart. And we also have um, the Somerville Community Corporation who provide services to for affordable housing, but they are also a landlord um, because they own units. Renee, I wanna put you on the spot there. What is the position of SCC as a landlord when it comes to your tenants unable to pay rent? Um, great, great question. I think we had um, been debating that internally with the organization. Um, we definitely don't want to evict anyone who um, is a tenant of SEC properties. I think what we did uh, since the, a big, um, the, the, the pandemic hit our community, it was to you know dedicate um, specific staff to work on um, RAF application. So you, we switch completely inside the organization. We, we put a lot of our project in hold and we dedicate 100% to fill out those applications to get you know, like the rental assistance those families need. I think right now we have a commitment to um, not evict anyone um, until the end of the year. I think the organization is having that conversation at the board level and how we can extend that. I'm, I'm aware that the new increase on, um, on RAF um, assistance up to 10,000 required the landlord and the homeowner a commitment to no evict um, uh, those tenants till, you know, like July, I think, 2021. Um, so I think we're, we're very worried about the situation. We want to help our, our resident. Um, we also have um, a program called the uh, uh, first source job program because I think the key component here is we know that people uh, lost their job, their you know like um, income, and now how we can help them to find another job. I think that is another piece that the work that we do. So you know anyone who is watching this, please contact SEC or first or job program if you um, need help looking for a job or get a better better job that you have right now. Thank you. So Renee, what kind of assistance as a not-for-profit agency providing um, affordable housing, what kind of assistance does your organization hope to get from the federal or state government? Are, are you in the same position that a private property owner would be? Um, I, I think yes, because we have, you know, like um, mortgage to pay in our, some of our properties. So, you know, like I think we have been, you know, like doing some research about, you know, what are those programs look like to, to help. 
um, the organization keep running. I think our, our first, you know, like um, step is to make sure, you know, we're going to get um, a rental system for those tenants who are in a difficult situation. I think right now we have a, a list of a half dozen people who has some issues that are SEC tenants. So the lease is no is not huge like in the in the private market. That is where we have seen, you know, like the big the big needs right now because those those uh rent are uh market rate market rate 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 um rent. Um so you know we're talking about some in some cases up to two thousand a month. So that is an is an issue that uh, we're we're seeing in in the community. Um, we have you know like most of our uh, housing are subsidized. So you know like is you know like depending on the income of the families how much they pay for rent. Okay, Renee, thanks. I mean that gives me a kind of a sense because uh, uh, you know I know generally how much property SEC owns in the city and how many rental units you administer. Ellen, I want to bounce back to you for one second and then over to Senator Jalen. What is the need right now in the city of Somerville? What kind of, I know the caseload must have increased for you folks exponentially, but can you give us a sense, give the, the viewers a sense of how many people in this city are at risk right now of losing their home without protection? Well, that's a really good question. I'm going to <clears throat> tell you first to Quickly about our caseload, I'd like to say what who's at risk, and I'd like to tell one story if I can to just give people a flavor of you know what we're seeing on the ground. We've had over a thousand requests for assistance since the pandemic, um, and that was almost four times our normal volume of requests for services. And frankly, we didn't have sufficient staffing to be able to address everyone's concerns immediately. We just did though get some additional funding, and we've hired four temporary staff who started last Monday to try to help us to get through our backlog of families that are in need of assistance. Um, so the need is dire. The need is the percentage of families that are at risk. I think you may have seen some, you know, some data out there saying that 20%, approximately 20% of all renters said that they were gonna have trouble paying their rent in future months. I've honestly seen numbers varying, you know, varying throughout the city. There's MAPC just put out a new report um, which provides numbers based on unemployment trends. Now, those numbers don't include undocumented folks because undocumented folks aren't applying for unemployment. Um, and they also don't include some other people who are ineligible for unemployment for other reasons. Um, but I'd like, to, I'd like to tell you a story of one family and so you can see how this, how this is unfolding over time. Um, back in, I think it was May or so, we had a family that came to us um, at the time we had applied for rental assistance, it was taking a while. While we applied for rental assistance, they both, both the mom and dad had lost their jobs because of COVID. They were both in the restaurant business and house cleaning business. Um, they lost their jobs due to COVID. And while we were helping them with rental assistance applications, mom ended up going into the hospital and mom ended up being on a respirator. And during this whole time, you know, we're supposed to get documents, right? To fill out all these documents for, for rental assistance. And there's a, an incredible amount of, the state is trying to make it less burdensome, but it is a lot of work to get anyone to do an, an application. People have to provide signatures for things. Well, how do people provide signatures if they don't have adequate technology, right? So many barriers. Anyway, fortunately, that mom, you know, she got out off the respirator. She's home now. But I spoke to her yesterday and her husband who had started working again, he's a painter. Her husband who had started working again, now that the winter months are coming, he just said the volume of indoor painting has just completely dried up. So they are now in that same situation again. And I think you know, this points to, and she's been unbelievably responsible in trying to reach us. She's now working. But what this really looked says is we need temporary solutions, some of which we have in place, but we also need longer term solutions because some percentage of the residents of Somerville that lost their jobs or had their hours reduced are not going to be able to regain the income that they had pre pandemic, at least for an extended period of time um, until the economy really changes substantially. So we at OHS are always trying to think of what are the 
immediate term, you know, short term, medium term, and long term to solutions to what had already been a crisis before the pandemic. Senator Jalen, I know that you wanted to, you may have some um, anecdotal stories that you wanted to convey the, of things that are coming into your office, but um, let, let me stop there for a second and just turn it over to you and have a conversation with Ellen and Renee. Well, I, I think actually Ellen and Renee know better, more stories than I do because they're more likely to have heard from people. Um, I know Renee introduced us to two families recently um, and I had heard her stories uh, over the summer. Um, so does either of you want to mention some of the other families that um, sure. can be affected by this? So I, from my experience, I think one of the most difficult um, uh, point in the, in, the, in the process is to convince the landlord to uh, sign documents. I think, um, you know, like over time, you know, like the people have you know, like share uh, among the community that this is the, a way that they they are going to get paid the, the, the rent that the um, uh, tenants own. Um, but, you know, like in the case of, you know, like these um, tenants, I think, you know, like uh, because they are immigrant and some of them are um, undocumented, I think the, the, the big issues is the fear. You know, like the fear that, you know, like the landlord is going to call the immigration service and, you know, like something's going to going to happen to their family. I think one of the cases that, you know, like um, we were trying to, you know, help um, this family, they got a notice to quit from the landlord, but they they didn't want to report it to the Office of Housing Stability because they they, they were some fears about that then you know like um i was able to to talk to this family you know like talk to the landlord and the landlord retracted from from the notice to quick right like because we have um uh, some you know like local ordinance that you know require the landlord to provide a lease of you know resource to the tenant when they submit this 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 notice and um, this landlord didn't do that so we have all the tenants have the right to you know like make a, a complaint to the city um but the fear around the immigration issues, you know, comes up. So, you know, like this is one case among many. Um, that is what is, you know, like the worry of the family. What we have seen lately is that people are getting back to, to work, not with the same, you know, like level of income. They are paying some of their rent, but they have, um, uh, you know, like they have, uh, they own rent to the landlord, you know, during because everything was closed during the pandemic. So now the increase on the wrap is 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 great because that is going to help us to you know like to, to you know like provide that rental assistance that those month from you know like June, July, um, till recently we're going to be able to cover those and because they're coming back to work they're, you know, like be able to, you know, like pay their rent, but, you know, like fear for, for, you know, like in immigration. And I know that Somerville is a, is a sanctuary city, but still, you know, like there, there are a lot of education that we need to do in our community. That is one uh, of the goal that we have with our program at SEC. Um, we have a new organizer, uh, Magdalena Gomez, who has been organizing some tenants in, in different part of the city. We want to educate those tenants because most of them, they don't know about their right. The, um, last time we, we, we ran up one of those, those workshop uh, for the Latino group, um, they didn't know that there are you know, affordable housing available for them. You know, like, so educating not just about tenants' right, but also the option that those, you know, like the, the, the city provide, nonprofit like SEC or the inclusionary zoning requirement for private developer. So it's a lot of work that is in front of us. Renee, thanks. I wanted to go back to one thing, Ellen, that you were, um, I don't know if you bordered on it or it was just coming into my head, that there is a, a, a trickle down effect on the public health of what we are doing. Yeah. Because as Renee is 
stating there are undocumented people in this city who are afraid to go to government to ask for assistance and because some unscrupulous landlord knows that mm -hmm. and is using that and saying either get out or else they are moving in with other friends or family and that is a potential hotbed of infection and transmission because now you have families doubling up and not out of ignorance of the law or any of that stuff, but because people are scared. They are desperate to keep a roof over their house. The one byproduct that I had not thought of, and yesterday's show was with chair of the Somerville School Committee and with um, another organization that we spoke about student population homelessness. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think people put all of these pieces of the puzzle together that you formerly had teenage kids at the high school who were the caregivers for their younger toddlers mm -hmm. and now the families are being split up. And guess what? That's adding to homelessness for some of the teens because they can't have a bed in somebody else's home. I mean, it, it, it is, it is not a one size fits all kind of pandemic. This is going after everybody and disrupting people's lives. Senator Jalen, I just, uh, between you and Ellen, I'm sorry, I had to put that in there that there is more than just people getting assistance to oh, pay yeah. their rent. I think that's like, there was a column in the globe that said if the evictions crisis affects all of us, we're in the middle of a new surge when the evictions start and people more and more are crowded into overcrowded apartments, the greatest source of transmission is within households. Yeah. So these are people who are, if they're employed are likely working in dangerous professions. They're in, uh, they're, those are the jobs that are available. They can't work online. They're working as CNAs, they're working in hospitals, the most dangerous professions in the state and they're working in retail maybe they're working in restaurants maybe but all jobs that involve interpersonal contact so they get the virus they bring it home there's three families in a three-bedroom apartment and, and one and bath, you're right there's the trickle down. Yeah, right. right so we know that will happen and that affects us all because they not only bring it home to their families, they bring it out into the community again. So it affects everybody, but your point about education is also important. Suppose there's six kids in a family all trying to use the internet to learn online. That wouldn't work in my house. I mean, people, people take turns and the commissioner of education says, you better be there. Yeah, it's, I, I did want to say a few things to give people in Somerville to know that there are some laws and tools that protect them, because I also do want them to know, and, and this follows from exactly what you're talking about, Joe, that people out there may or may not know that in March, the mayor and the Board of Health issued a local emergency declaration, and under the terms of that declaration, nobody can be physically removed from their homes for exactly the reasons that you're saying, for the because of the public health consequences of COVID spread due to doubling up or homeless or street homelessness or crowding in shelter environments. So in the city of Somerville, regardless of whether a court orders somebody evicted or not, it is unlawful for a constable or a deputy sheriff to use what is called an execution. It is illegal for them to use that execution to evict someone from their homes. So if anybody ever gets a notice from a constable saying, we're coming back in 48 hours and we're moving your stuff, they need to immediately get in touch with me, not just put their name online, but Ellen Schachter, 781-307-3307. Contact me directly because it really moves fast. Those are 40 out, eight hour notices of levy. And unless we know about it, illegal evictions can happen. Um, you know, 
So we really want to be prepared to respond in case any constable or any deputy sheriff is not complying with the local Somerville ordinance or law. It's even possible that not everyone will know about it. So we really need to get that word out and to make sure that people understand that. The other thing I, oh, yeah. I was just gonna say one more thing Somerville's doing, or should I, I'll break. Well, no, I think backing that up is um, a statement that was issued by CDC and NIH saying, it is the dumbest possible policy to evict people during a pandemic and force them to double up into small overcrowded places or possibly even be spreaders by moving from one community to another. That's exactly right. And the Center for Disease Control, while I don't support a lot of things that come out of the federal government, did a really, really good job of tying the public health emergency to what's happening with evictions and the federal eviction moratorium. So I think that's another important piece just to touch on right now is the federal eviction moratorium, if that's okay to say a moment about that. Because while we know that the state moratorium ended, there is still a federal moratorium that runs until December 31st of this year. So that's another about, what, do we, what does that give us? Another two months, right? About two months of a moratorium. But in order for a tenant to be protected under that moratorium, there's a declaration that that tenant has to sign and give to their landlord. And it is really important that everybody in the community is helping to make sure that tenants know this and that they sign. There's a link on our website, which is somervillema.gov slash OHS. It's also easy to find if you Google it. It's on the National, um, the National Low Income Housing Coalition's workshop, but you can get it on ours. Ours is local and easy. It's right there. It's easy to do. Um, so we're really, really urging tenants, as long as what they say in that declaration is true. I want to be clear, though, that it would be signing a statement under oath that they've had some loss in income due to COVID or increase in medical expenses, that they have been making partial payments as they are able based on their income, and that they're doing everything they can or doing what they can to apply for rental assistance. Mm. So those are the pieces of the puzzle for who is eligible for uh, an extended federal moratorium. So we have to get the word out. We have to get people giving those to their landlords as much as possible, because that will give us some more time and time both because of the rental application process and also because the state is in the process of rolling out this eviction diversion initiative. There are things that will be in place in two months that are not in place right now. So really getting that additional time is critical. So Ellen, I assume that you and Renee, your organizations are working in, in concert to try to get this information out. You've got my pledge. I think I directed for that contact information be put up on uh, Somerville Media Center's uh, community okay. bulletin board and our wheel. We're gonna be playing this program repeatedly. I know that you've done your stuff on government channel. Um, Renee and his organization is doing the outreach. But I wanted to go. I wanted to go to one piece of this, and and it touches on something that I think um, may be relevant. That even though we're, you know, we are seeing the numbers surge. We're, uh, I hate to use the word surge because it's a frightening word. Here in Somerville, we are seeing our numbers tick up. They are not exponentially growing, but they are growing, and that is an offshoot of colder months are coming. People are still on the move. People are spending more times indoors. Mm -hmm. And the consequence of that is that, and I think you all know that I do something else here in the city. The consequence of that is that the restaurant industry employs in this city alone, mm -hmm. the restaurant industry employs anywhere between 2,000 and 3,000 full and part-time people. Mm -hmm. As those businesses mm -hmm. contract, they're losing their income, which is going to exacerbate what you folks are working on. Yeah. Just one thing to mention on that, and I, I want to give other people a chance, but the, I wanted to give a shout out to Tom Gelagani from the city, who is our economic development person. The city gave out an extensive uh, amount of money in small business loans to businesses that were impacted by COVID. And there is another 
round of money that's going to become available very soon. So there'll be another um, application process for small businesses to apply. I mean, obviously the loss is tremendous and the city will never be able to make up 100% of the loss of those businesses or keep everybody employed. But we are trying to do what we can and there will be another round to pay attention to. In addition, I just wanted to mention while I have the chance that about $1.5 million in, low, in rental assistance administered by the Somerville Homeless Coalition and the Community Action Agency of Somerville and just to start, hopefully we'll be on the streets ready to apply for around Thanksgiving, um, that the contracting process will be done. So there are going to be some new important resources available locally here so that raft is not the only option for people who are in need of rental assistance. And, and in a very direct, indirect way, um, in addition to the work that the economic development team has done, um, at 4.30 this afternoon, I'll be conducting a Somerville Licensing Commission hearing. Um, and we have a request before us from the mayor, directly from the mayor, um, for another half a million dollars in a relief package for the restaurant industry. Yeah. So it is only within our purview to do that. Um, the other two commissioners will be on board with me at 4.30. Um, we'll see how it goes. We're, you know, we're not allowed to discuss the cases, but I'm, I'm confident that the licensing commission will do the right thing. I want, Senator Jalen, I want to bring you back into the conversation here. For, from the standpoint of you have been fighting for um, gig workers since the beginning. Mm. Um, and, and it appears to me just by the socioeconomic um, segment of the population that gig workers, restaurant workers, service industry workers, all are at the most risk of losing their homes. Do you wanna take a kind of a stab at, at how many people we're talking about? I mean, I can tell you what the restaurant industry employs, but how many other people, we have artists that, that are at risk of losing their homes. As Renee, Renee mentioned, painters, house painters, um, people who do the service industry work every day. And what I've heard anecdotally is that the medical industry itself is now starting to look at layoffs. And that will include mm -hmm. people who are the, uh, I'm not being disrespectful, but the bedpan emptiers, the cleaners, the cafeteria mm -hmm. workers, the food service workers in our medical facilities, those are all people who make barely minimum wage. How do we put our arms around the fact that there are gonna be more people filing for unemployment in the future? I mean, well, I, it's beyond me. You just have to understand that the extended benefits run out at the end of December. So people who've been counting on unemployment, and that's um, almost a million people in Massachusetts are gonna lose all their income in January as the federal moratorium expires. And, and now Ellen, for the winter, winter. I'm sorry, Senator, for the larger part, Ellen, that's a good makeup of their current income is their unemployment. Absolutely. There's a, a you know, in we have sort of a group, different groups of populations. There's the undocumented folks, which were hard hit that haven't been getting unemployment this whole time. And then there's a group that both lost their pandemic extra, you know, a little while ago, extra weekly payments, but will lose it entirely at the end of the year. I, I did just want people to know there are, between the Homeless Coalition and CAS, there are programs that not only will pay the arrears, but, ex, but prospective rent for between three and 12 months to give people a time to get reemployed. So I don't want people to think that, that you know, we're just throwing up our hands and saying nothing, there's nothing we can do. We cannot meet the scope of what is needed without help from the federal government and more help from the state government. That's absolutely clear. But we are trying to do our best to think about those prospective needs for rent for people just like you're saying, whose benefits are gonna run out, who don't get back. A lot of people I'm finding do get jobs back, but not full time. They're dividing up jobs between their prior employees. So someone's working, you know, 20 hours instead of 40 and they just can't make it. And those are some of the folks that I feel the most concerned about 
because there may not be a good long-term prognosis for how they're going to get those hours back anytime soon. Absolutely, Ellen. I've heard the stories, you know, for the past three to four months that full-time people are being, you know, given part-time positions and those who were part-time, their hours are being decreased. That's right. So it, it, it is a perfect storm that's coming up. We're already in the middle of it, but I think, I don't want to be the downer here, but I think unless the federal government mm -hmm. and the state government mm -hmm. get their act together very quickly, they are going to regret it mm -hmm. because there will be a day of reckoning sometime in January when none of us will be able to figure this out without mm -hmm. a huge infusion of federal money. Mm -hmm. So okay. I want to give over the last couple of minutes, Ellen, if you want to wrap it up, Senator Jalen and Renee, some closing thoughts on how we move forward and information about how the public can get a hold of you. Yes, I'll I just think, think that, that we should be so, we are so lucky in Somerville to have a really progressive uh, city government that has really stepped up. And, and I think Ellen, you're the, your office is the place that people turn, will turn and should turn for, for finding out all the resources that are available. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot here. Um, yes. So people should know, I mean, not enough, right. but a lot. And right. uh, I, I'm very, very grateful. And I'm grateful to uh, SCC and CAS mm -hmm. and, all, and the Homeless Coalition, all the people that are working mm -hmm. so hard to make, to try to save uh, lives and families. So thank you. And I think that's what I would want to say to wrap up. We do have a citywide Know Your Rights Coalition that, that, that is bringing together the Office of Immigrant Affairs, the service providers, my office, and others to really think about the best ways to get the word out. We're hoping to have some banners up around the city um, with information. And definitely go to our website. It's super easy to put in. It says make a referral. And if you put your name and information there, um, that's the best way to get through to us unless it's an emergency, in which case you call me directly. Um, but please, you know, please do feel free to reach out. There's a lot of good materials on our website as well, even if you don't, you know, you mm. don't want to do the uh, full referral. Um, so we hope that you'll reach out and thank you. And thank you so much both to you, Joe, to my partner, Renee, SCC, huge, important partner in this whole struggle and to Senator Jalen for making this such an important priority. You have put such, um, so much of your heart and soul into this eviction endings process and trying to get everything you can at the legislature. And I am so grateful to be not only in a city that's progressive, but to have a fantastic mm -hmm. Senator that is always by our side. So thank you so much, Senator Jalen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Senator Yellen and Joe and Alan, because um, you know, like the Office of Housing Stability has been the, the place that are bringing all these organ local organizations and several together to, you know, like have a, a very clear mandate and how we can help our, our community. Um, I think, you know, like for us, you know, like if people wants to get in contact with us, the phone number for our tenant organizer, Magdalena Gomez is 617-410-9917. Please call her if you need, you know, like um, help and, um, for rental assistance, go to our webpage at somervillecdc.org if you need help uh, looking for a job every Thursday between 10 and 12, we have um, uh, a meeting called the Networking Cafe when we have, you know, like employers coming to do presentation and help you to apply for, you know, openings that are coming up. So thank you very much for all your work and we will be, you know, willing to keep moving and supporting the community that we love. Renee Mardonis, Somerville Community Corporation, Ellen Schachter, Office of Housing Stability, City of Somerville, and uh, I don't know who this other woman is that's been on there. <laughs> that's my friend of over 20 years, Senator Pat Jalen. I wanna thank you all for the work you do. Um, please be aware that you have a friend in the Somerville Media Center. Whatever you need us to do, give me a call directly. You all have my cell phone. For thank the you. Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Thank you for watching. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you the next time.